Why is wine the first miracle of Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 2. The interesting part about John is he keeps enumerating each of the days, the next day, the next day. And here we start off John 2 on the third day was at the wedding in Cana in Galilee, same Galilee area. And Jesus is with his mother. They're both there, invited to the wedding with his disciples. Wine runs out, no more wine. And Mary asks Jesus to do something about it. The response that Jesus gives to her, it says, woman, what does this have to do with me? It sounds harsh, but the word woman is more of a term of respect. Don't read it like woman. Read it like ma'am <laughs> and be old old fashioned or madam, you know, this is a this is a respect word. So don't think he is slighting his mother here at all. But my time has not yet come, he says to her. Mary, being not diverted from her goal, turns to the servants and says, you know, do whatever he tells you to do. Then Jesus takes the water that was probably there for ceremonial purposes and turns it into wine. The servants start to chew the wedding guests. And when they taste it, they didn't know where it came from, probably because it was so good. Jesus in his gifts, provides the best. Even there was a comment that most everyone serves the best wine first because what you do is you get everyone drunk on wine. They can't even tell that you had good wine or bad wine any, anymore because you're no longer capable of determining that. So this person says, wow, you even served this wine after the first wine. Amazing. Amazing that this kind of quality comes in later. This is the first sign of Jesus. And it says that it manifests his glory. And his disciples were, wow, it says he, his disciples believed in him. Went down from Capernaum with his mothers and his brothers and his disciples. I mentioned before that in Catholicism, people believe that this is his brothers are meant to be like his apostles, his brothers in service of giving the message of God. It also could be, and this was the other explanation I saw, this idea that Joseph had other children before he married Mary, because it is considered married was a young girl. That was the word that was used for her, but that Joseph was older. And so maybe he had a previous marriage. But either way, I'm not going to get into a fight about it because I think we'll find out in heaven. It's one of those things we don't know, we're not sure about, and there's no real reason to fight about it. It says that this amount of wine that he created was about 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Wow, a lot of wine in this, but this was a message of joy. You wonder, why wine? Why would wine be his first miracle? And the idea is that God wants us to be joyful. A wedding is a gift of God, an amazing gift of God, something to be celebrated when a man leaves his mother and father and a woman leaves her mother and father and they come together in this marriage bond. It's, it's a miracle that this is the pattern that God set up for all the people. The Passover was at hand. This is an early Passover. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found that they were selling oxen and sheep and the money changers were all there. And he made a whip of cords. We've seen that he drove them out. In this particular case, he, he made a whip. Drove out the people selling all these animals and the money changers and turned over the tables. It says that, you know, get rid of these things. Don't make my father's house a house of trade. For he calls them robbers. That was a later addition where he drives them out. Obviously, Jesus drives out the money changers and the people selling things, and they come back the next day, right? But the point of it is, this was not what the temple was meant to do. This was something that Herod built so that this could happen. And people were getting rich off of this. Don't turn my house into a house of trade. This isn't a marketplace. It says his disciples remembered, the zeal for your house will consume me. Meaning he is obsessed with God's house. This was the place of worship for all people. We're going to change away from that with Jesus' death. But for right now and for all of history, this was the temple that was taken out in a tabernacle from the Exodus, brought back to Israel. Solomon built the temple. 
it is destroyed. Now Herod put together something even bigger than it was before. But was it better? Some people have tried to give some kind of an estimate. It said that the normal population of Jerusalem were somewhere around 60,000 people. But it went up 100,000, 250,000 people during the time of Passover. And if you said that those animals were a certain price, the temple tax was two denarii, two days labor. Passover, then also you had to buy the animal for sacrifice. This was big bucks. And the idea is that when people were allowed to be in their markets in the temple area, the temple was also taking a cut of that profit too. This was big bucks. This was a big industry. And this is not what the temple was supposed to be. We will someday get to the part where sacrifice is brought in to the Jewish faith. And it has to do with giving something, your first fruits, giving something important, something that matters to God. This idea of going into a market and just buying a couple pigeons and giving them It's not where it was meant to be. And this temple was meant to be holy. People called Mount Zion the holy mountain. And unfortunately, it's no longer that. Jesus now in Jerusalem for the Passover's feast. This is not the final feast. It said many believed in his name, saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, it said, didn't entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He knows what goes on in the heart and understands what's going on in their brains. He knows really what they're thinking. And he didn't rely on the fact that other men would bear witness to him because he knows what's inside of other men. And it's not good. But he does include us in his miracles, but he also knows our heart too. And that ends John 2. What I'm going to meditate on is this idea of God cares about our believing in him, in keeping holy things holy. We just saw that at the temple. But he also cares about our joy, our joy over each other's marriages, our joy over each of the successes of each of the events that happen in people's lives day to day that matter the most. This wine in general is seen as joy. It's also seen as the blood of Christ that was, we'll get to later. It's a sign that God wants us to rejoice as well. What I'm going to pray about is keeping holy things holy. I go to a church that is very concerned, I think, with keeping holy things holy. We don't try to divert our church into different things that we could become, maybe even make us more popular, make us more fancy and exciting to be in. So I I appreciate that about my church. And the idea is that what can we do to make sure that our holy places, particularly our churches, are places where we worship or read the scripture, stays holy to God, that we keep the holy things holy. And what I'm going to pray about is that I always recognize those two things, the places where we should have joy and celebration and the places that we should take seriously and keep holy. And what I'm going to share with others is that God does produce wine. He does include himself in celebrations. Sometimes Particularly, I think in the past, religion could be very morbid, very solemn, take this very seriously. I think we see people celebrate. We see places where they're ecstatic. We see places where they dance with joy. And now we see a wedding where there is wine and celebration. And Jesus is a part of that too. We have seen places in the Bible where Jesus might even be a little bit funny, might be telling a bit of a joke or making fun of his apostles at their expense a little bit to prove a point. You don't think he's this dour guy that so many have seen him as throughout the church history. This shows that side of him that wants celebration. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have other podcasts too. You can find them all at a betterlifeinsmallsteps.com. And have a wonderful day. Bye.